It's time for Get the Lack Scoop, a podcast bringing you all the people and stuff you should know in the game of lacrosse. We take lack seriously, but ourselves, not so much. Join host Big Dog and Jay Bird and the biggest names in the game. Brought to you by Jay McMahon Lacrosse. That's JML, skills, mindset, and lax IQ training. Ron Douglas, the big dog, was a collegiate football and lacrosse player at Brown. He was also an assistant lacrosse coach and the executive director of the Sports Foundation. And Jay McMahon, the Jaybird, a three-time All-American midfielder at Brown. He was a captain of the U.S. Junior National Team and is the founder of JML. And joining us in the studio, Steve Grisalfi, whose collegiate lacrosse career statistics equals one goal against Dartmouth. Brought to you by Jay McMahon Lacrosse. That's JML, skills, mindset, and lax IQ training, helping the next generation of cross players get to the next level. Friends, <laughs> welcome to another episode of Get the Lax Scoop. We're excited. This is our brotherly love episode tonight. Two tremendous players who hail from Long Island. So God bless JLB, you know, outing. Two the more people from Long, Long Island, Island all night. Good and Lord. great coaches, Ron. Let's Jay, go. enough of you already. We're just going to get started. All right. I'm already, Please. I've already had enough. Ron, just start the intro. Our first guest, a native native of Levittown, New York. He was an all Long Island Catholic League lacrosse player at Chaminade High. He went on to play collegiately at UMass Amherst, graduating cool loud in 1986. You learn something new about someone every day, Jay. That that I did not know about this guest. I have to say Um, I was a little shocked, but had a degree in economics. No, no, very (laughs) guys, an intellect of the game. He was a two-year starter and an all-New England defenseman. Uh, as a senior, he helped lead the Minutemen to the 1986 NCAA quarterfinals. From Amherst, he went on to enjoy a successful post-college playing career. He was four-time All-U.S. Club Association team and was invited to the U.S. National Team tryouts three times. This guy was simply one of the best defenders in the country of his era. And in 1989, he began his first of two stints at Notre Dame accepting an assistant coaching position where he remained until the end of the 91 season. Uh, in 1999, he was inducted into the New England chapter of the U.S. Lacrosse Hall of Fame and was named the 2001 New Hampshire High School Coach of the Year while directing the Sahegan High School squad. He served as head coach at St. Anselm's College in Manchester, New Hampshire from 2003 to 2006. And while there, he guided the Hawks to 16 victories with the 05 squad setting the program record for the lowest goals against and for ground balls in a season. In August 2006, he returned to South Bend to run the Irish defensive unit. He helped end Notre Dame to 14 NCAA tournament appearances, including 13 straight, 11 conference titles, and an overall record of 170 and 78. That's 685 for us non-math majors. Not bad, not bad. Notre Dame, which earned one of eight national seeds in 11 of the last 12 years he was at Notre Dame, reached the quarterfinals round or later on 10 different occasions and twice earned a spot in the Division I finals in 2010 and 2014. Now look, under his watch, Notre Dame just firmly established itself as one of the top defensive teams in the country. And this guy earned a reputation as simply one of the top minds in the game, especially at the defensive end of the field. And the Fighting Irish finished among the top five in the nation in scoring defense seven times in his 13 seasons. Seven times? That's amazing. Yes, yes, Jay, I read that correctly. That was seven times in 13 years, top five in the country. It is incredible. Had the stingiest defensive group in 2009 and 2012, uh, and the 2012 club boasted the best man down defense in Division I. The guy can coach defense, period. Sure sounds like it. His work did not go unnoticed. He was named the 2011 Collegiate Men's Lacrosse Coaches Association National Assistant Coach of the Year. Say that fast three times. His excellence Mm -hmm. on the sideline was also recognized as a key part of the Coaching Staff of the Year Award in the Great Western League twice in 07 and 09 and once in the Big East in 2012. He is now entering his fifth season as the Frisbee family head coach at Harvard University. During his time in Cambridge, he quickly returned the Crimson Lacrosse program to the national spotlight. 
Well, his first two seasons must have been a rough start. Your first two seasons as a head coach at Harvard, 20 and 21, were essentially those seasons canceled in the Ivy League due to the COVID-19 pandemic. But in his first full season in 22, Harvard earned a spot in the NCAA tournament for the first time since 2014. Four of the Crimson's eight wins that year were over ranked opponents, and Harvard was consistently in the national rankings, getting as high as number 10 in the country. The Crimson continued to demonstrate the ability to play with the best teams in the country in 2023, highlighted by a massive upset win over number four, Cornell Big Red. Our guest coach, a defensive unit that finished among the best in the nation last year. The Crimson ride was third best in the country, holding teams to under 80% clearing success. And the defense finished fourth in the, na- fourth in the nation with 10.5 caused turnovers per game. The Harvard man down unit allowed, this was crazy to me, only nine goals the entire year. And finished is... as the best man down unit in the league. It's amazing. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to welcome the head men's lacrosse coach for the Harvard Crimson, Jerry Byrne. Mm-hmm. Jerry, welcome. Awesome. What a record, huh? That intro is longer than Avatar. Huh? <laughs> yeah, we don't mess around. We don't mess around. I mean, we left out a lot of stuff. Touching all, all right. bases, Jerry. That's right. All right, our next guest also grew up in Levittown, New York, located right in the middle of Nassau County, Ron, on Long Island. He picked up his first stick in January of his freshman year in high school and took off from there. He was an all-county defenseman for the Levittown Division Blue Dragons. He next attended the University of Virginia, where he was a captain, a three-time All-American, an ACC MVP, a Smicer Cup and Heroes Award winner as the best defenseman in Division I lacrosse. During his time at UVA, his teams went to one national championship and three Final Fours. After college, he continued to play okay, that, high level. That seems that's like impressive. A, a pretty good career. Can we pause there, please? That's that not was... bad. That's, That's a hell of a college that. career right there. It is. Yeah. Incredible. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Let's, let's give a little credit, ponder Jerry, that. for Christ's right. sake. Well, let's sink in. Can I continue, Ron? Please, Jack. Please. Thank you. After college, he continued to play high-level club lacrosse in a variety of cities and states as he moved around the country, working for General Electric. He was a member of the 1986 world champion U.S. national lacrosse team, winning gold in Toronto, Canada and was an alternate on the 1990 and 1994 national teams. He's been inducted into the Long Island Metro Lacrosse Hall of Fame, as well as the Virginia Lacrosse Hall of Fame. In 2003, he was named to the 50th anniversary ACC lacrosse team. The game of lacrosse has taken him around the country as he's played and coached in over 20 states. Over the past 15 years, he's been engaged with building the game in Cleveland, Ohio, where he lives with his wife and daughter, He's been a head coach for Gilmore Academy and Shaker Heights High Schools. Presently, he's an assistant coach at Shaker Heights, coaching the defense. Please welcome one of the Wahoos' all-time greats and a man who will always remain Coach Jerry Byrne's big brother. Again, please welcome <laughs> Coach Steve Byrne. Thank you. Hey, welcome, welcome, Steve. Be here, guys. Thanks for really, joining us. Yeah, really fun to have you guys with us. And, you know, Jerry, you were asking earlier why we st- – you know, how we got into this whole thing. And I think you guys really epitomize that, which is Jay and I have been friends for, you know, 30 plus years and we only know each other because of the game of lacrosse. And, you know, over all the years, we just came to appreciate all the incredible relationships in the game. And it's fun. You're our first brother combination to be on, but clearly you guys. So you guys uh, might've known each other without lacrosse, but most of us wouldn't basically. So Steve, (laughs) Uh, we always like to start with how you develop your passion for the game. And so tell us when you first started playing the sport. And I understand there may be somebody that our listeners may yeah. recognize who first had a role in getting a stick in your hand. Yeah, no, for sure. I'm at it, lacrosse uh, in our house really wasn't a thing. It was football, basketball, baseball, and then any other makeup game that you could figure out to, uh, with your, your buddies on the street. So I went to a Catholic high school, one through eight, St. Bernard's. And my gym teacher, my seventh and eighth grade years was Bill Tierney. who's was also a Levittown guy. He's on the South side. We like to call it uh, Levittown slope. And we were in <laughs> Levittown Heights. On the on the, in the Heights. Nice. Yeah. yeah. 
So yeah, so Bill, I mean, he he would bring the sticks out. We never really did much with it, but it was literally the first lacrosse stick I ever held. And he he was, I don't know, 23, 24. So we used to go see the Long Island Tomahawks was an indoor league that was on for a few years. We go to Nassau Coliseum, there'd be there'd be 150 people and you know, 10 of us, you know, 13, 14 year olds just chasing balls in the stands. But that was literally the first time I, I held a stick, and I do remember that, and do remember him. And uh, so when I, when it was, I had to figure out where I was going to high school. My older brother was at Holy Trinity on Long Island. Um, was thinking about Holy Trinity, Shamanad. But at the end of the day, all my buddies were going to Division, the public school, and I knew my parents really didn't have the money for us for me to go. Um, because they were saving it for their favorite child, Jerry, who was going to come out three years <laughs> from there. <laughs> they, they could really predict the future. They should have done much more of that with Wall Street. They knew I was more of the intellect. And he was <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll get to you. We'll get to you later. So I played football, and towards the end of football, at the end of football, I don't know how it happened, but everybody started talking about lacrosse because Division had a good lacrosse history. They had a good lacrosse team, and I'm like, I never played lacrosse. So uh, basically, myself and probably at least two thirds of the team had never picked up a stick. So you know, my best friend lived down the street from me, and he was a tremendous athlete. Ended up going to Maryland to play. Um, so we just got sticks and started playing. And uh, so I, I get my stick in the middle, middle of January with my, my birthday and just started playing. It was fun with your friends. It, it was so much more fun than football. I love playing football, love playing football games. I hated, despise football practice. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> just, it's just, it's no fun. You can have fun in a, in a lacrosse practice. Right. Yeah. We had a lot of fun. And I, these were all my closest friends. And uh, we were all starting together and, and we just progressed, you know, from that ninth grade uh, team to our senior year where, you know, we were the best team on Long Island. That's awesome. Jerry, That's just great. like recruiting today, most of you guys pick up a stick, you know, just starting in freshman year and then become three-time All-Americans. You know, it's just how uh, it works. They, right? they pick up one of their seven sticks that they're, they're... <laughs> <laughs> they have one for each day of the week. Yeah. But Jerry, what was it like for you growing up in Levittown there on Long Island? And tell us about your experience when you first started out. Did, well, I think what, did you know, one Steve of the reasons, influence you or, or not? Oh, of course. But I think <laughs> one, one of the reasons why there's so many really good athletes from Levittown is like, you know, there, there was some some real characters and hoodlums in that town. Like you really you had to dodge people throwing rocks and bottles at you driving down the street. So it really, <laughs> really helped develop your agility. As you, walk your around, toes, huh? as you walk around town, people throwing, you know, uh, fireworks at you. <laughs> as you drove, drove by. Batteries. What's that exactly? So, um, you know, Coach Tierney was the gym teacher at, at St. Bernard's. And, you know, he was, you know, obviously still remains a very charismatic character. And, you know, it was, it was, it was almost like a Pied Piper. It, it didn't really convert much like Steve was saying. It did. There was a, a youth team. The, were they the Tomahawks, Steve? What was the, the Tomahawks? Yeah. But we didn't play like we again. We played hoop and and football and and it hadn't really kind of converted. No. And so when Steve started playing, I didn't like. You know, by the time my brother became like one of the great players in college lacrosse, I wasn't even playing yet. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, it's going to not come out right, but like, like I grew like six or seven inches in one year, and I, <laughs> you know, it, it was an awkward phase that some people still think I'm going through, but, but uh, you know, I, I, I legitimately got cut from every team at Chamonix. My parents, it looked like a great decision to send me to the academic school, <laughs> let, my brother, let my brother go to the public school in, in town and I, 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 it's a real story. Like I cut, got cut from America. I loved basketball. I peaked, my peak basketball was like freshman year. I made the freshman team at Chaminade. And my mother literally was chastising me. Like I was reading my, doing my summer reading, like at Chaminade, they gave you a book. 
to read during the summer. And I'm sitting there reading. My guess it was like Papillon or The Hobbit or something. And I'm reading that. My mother, we had this room in our house. You know, you know, this is Long Island in the mid 80s. You had a room that you, no one went in unless you had guests. Right. That rug. We didn't have plastic the on the furniture, room. but it was close. Right. And, and so I'm sitting in this room that I'm not supposed to be laying in. My mother comes walking in. And she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm reading my, doing my summer reading. She goes, no, what are you doing? Got to get, get up and do something. She's like, this is not the motivation you want. My mother's like, look at your brother. I'm not saying she was smoking, but she might have been smoking. She was like, put that look book down. Brother. Look at your brother. He's like one of the best players in this sport. He just started playing like three years ago. <laughs> Basically, you're a stiff. What are you doing? You should play this sport. So I gave it. So literally that summer my brother is a i don't know sophomore junior at virginia and jim adams ran a camp at blair academy oh god and i you know is I've that never, in new jersey blair yeah academy. yeah okay. blair's town and, and i've right. never played i've never played lacrosse before and wow and my mom's like you know i just talked to mrs whatever mrs smith you know johnny's sick they have an extra spot in the camp <laughs> You, you, your brother's working the camp. You're going. I'm like, so and that's you're leaving that book up. here. Put it down. Yeah, put that book down, <laughs> you nerd. And <laughs> and I went to the camp, and I got connected with you know guys that I had con kind of gone to grammar school with who are now going to public school. The Cook family, which is a famous Cornell family. Mm -hmm. Eddie was my year. Yeah. Todd Esposito became a great player at. Virginia, Joe okay. Weingart, my one of my closest friends, was the first All-American in St. John's history. So this group of guys from our town were going to this camp. And Stephen right. was working the camp. And we went, and we had an unbelievable time. I fell in love with the game. And, you know, we terrorized this camp, which is a whole other podcast. But <laughs> it was, you know, that was the thing. So Bill, being the gym teacher, kind of exposed us to the game. And, but, like, my mother's, you know, basically lighting a fire under my ass. My brother as an, as a model of a guy who was a really good athlete and just could kind of and fell in love with it too. It was, you know, that was inspiring. My mom challenging me and then just kind of going to this camp with a bunch of guys you grew up with. And those guys are my friends to this day based on just going to that camp. Wow. That's awesome. Great, great story. Yeah. Such great stuff. So, so Ron, Jeff, I think I have the next question. I'm sorry, Jay, sorry. Go Stick right to ahead. the script Jeez. here. Steve, back to you, if it's all right with Ron. Now, as a Levitan Division Blue Dragon, who were some of your biggest rivals in high school? And then just as a little follow up on that, too, is how did you when did you know you wanted to play college lacrosse? And what was that recruiting process like? But I, I was hoping I went to Garden City High, hoping maybe we were good enough to be your guys rivals back then. Eventually we were. Yeah. Oh, God, no. So, I mean, yeah, I think the, you know, other than Memorial, but Memorial was okay, you know, when, when we were playing. So when I was freshman, sophomore, and then varsity, we never had an issue with them. But we always, Garden City was a was a huge rival. We all knew who nice. the Worstels were. We knew the Hollises were. Right. And so we played them ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. So they were in our in our group. Right. And so we, you know, we disliked them. Right. But I understand yeah. that. It was a big but, rivalry when I was there. But it was it was it was a really <clears throat> good rivalry and it was real it was like there was like mutual respect. And right. there was so so it's like I don't hate them, but you know, I, I have a I have the challenge for me on rivals is who do I hate more, Cold Spring Harbor or Manhattan? That's right. 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 Awesome. Good deal. Uh, That's a good list right there. But it was all but it was also there was a you know, not between the players, but and probably more evident now, but it was it was, it was also, you know, there's two social two different social Oh yeah. That's that stories. was that was huge. I mean, right. so I, Jerry 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 reminded me of a story I I've, I've told he was at a Harvard event a few weeks ago. He calls me, he goes, I told you a story I and everybody wanted to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's well, telling it to telling it to Mickey Cavuti. Oh, great! And yeah, Mickey so, and I were classmates at Garden City. So we we were. Um, 
I think I was, I think it was our freshman year, maybe our sophomore year. I mean, and, and my cohort, the guys that I went four years with, we were really good and we had good teams. The division had good teams each year. My junior year, we beat Cardin City in the, in the uh, semifinal. And I, I, I was covering uh, Hollis, who was outstanding. We were all over Worcestel, and it was, you know, it was a huge win. We played them at, at our place. But when I was in, I think it was ninth. Not, not grade, one piece of grass on that field. Right. Yeah, it, was, it was horrible. We there, actually was no ground, there was no groundskeeper <laughs> at Levittown Division. Right. No groundskeeper right. position. Yeah. The gravel field. It's terrible. <laughs> we, we transitioned to uh, JML. and Let's do that. We'll get into a little bit of the mindset. We'll do a mindset minute here. Steve and Jerry Byrne are describing the mentality of their team, a mentality developed growing up in the hard scrabble environment of Levittown, New York on Long Island, and that sense of self as being less privileged than their neighboring towns of Manhasset, Garden City, and Cold Spring Harbor motivated them and fueled them to play with, with what? With energy, with emotion, with high octane, and when faced with adversity to overcome it time and time again. Of course, not everyone is from a less than or financially underprivileged upbringing, but we can all appreciate the fact that what was motivating the Byrne brothers and fueling their intense emotions, regardless of the tangible differences in their standard of living, was simply an intangible idea in their mind. Having played against the Levittown Division Blue Dragons two times a year, and often a third time come the playoffs, while at Garden City High School, I know from experience how tough their athletes were and are. And having coached many players over the years, I know a lot of players struggle with the intangible quality of toughness, especially young players. They have trouble wrapping their mind around being tough. But what is toughness? Let's think about who exemplifies toughness. All current and former top lacrosse players like Gary and Paul Gate, Dave Petromala, Brody Merrill, Paul Grable, Lyle Thompson, Rob Pinnell, were and are all tough. We could think of basketball greats like Michael Jordan, LeBron James, and even smaller, less physical players like Allen Iverson or Steph Curry. Steph Curry is not a physically imposing player, but he is tough. So toughness can be thought of as being competitive, and being competitive can be thought of as going all out, giving a full effort, not a partial effort. Not trying some of the time, but giving it everything we've got. Dig digging deep into every fiber of our being and unleashing all we can summon in every moment of a contest, regardless of outcome. That is toughness. So toughness is an idea, a decision as to how we will act on the field of play. Dom Storgi used to say, consistency is the most powerful form of mental toughness. And why are we talking about toughness? Because toughness is one of only four elements that all college lacrosse coaches use to evaluate a recruit. So each and every one of us, regardless of our background, can make the decision to go all out consistently. To simply make that decision, we can get motivated by that challenge to remain focused and present and to demand the very best effort. Not a perfect effort, not a mistake-free performance, but an all-out effort, which will be hard for any opponent to match. We can all do that. We can all create an idea as to why we are going to go all out, not hold back in this or any particular contest. We can decide to truly and absolutely give it everything we've got, no matter what, in every moment of every minute of that contest. We can decide to not quit when things don't go our way. We can decide to act as if our very lives depended on the all out effort. And if we do, we'll see the kind of results the hard scrabble Blue Dragons of Levittown Division with players like Steve and Jerry Burnsaw time after time. You mentioned earlier we have put together a Patreon page for the show. This will allow those interested in supporting our efforts to do just that and to get exclusive access to unedited interviews, big discounts on JML online courses, and merchandise from our new online store. We have big additions to the JML course catalog. Now we have a defenseman's course taught by none other than UVA head lacrosse coach Lars Tiffany and a goalie course taught by former two-time All-American and two-time national champion and UVA assistant coach Kip Turner. 
you can check out our Patreon page with the link that is listed in the description, as well as taking a look at the online store again with the link listed in the description. We will return to our interview in progress. So my freshman year and, and sophomore year coach was a basketball guy named Randy Mertz, who was like probably my favorite coach of all time. He kept it fun, kind of didn't know what he was doing, but he knew basketball and lacrosse was close enough. Couldn't catch or throw the ball, but he knew how to manage us. And we were, you know, we were talented, undisciplined, a little crazy. Uh, we fought all the time. We, our freshman year, the AD had to come to us probably two thirds through the meeting, through the season said, if you, you guys have one more fight, you're not playing next year. Ooh. And so, so we couldn't fight anymore. <laughs> so, so, you know, we all, and we, you know, we're, we're talking to the upperclassmen. So we're finding out about Manhasset and we're finding out about Cold Spring Harbor and Garden City, all the big names, all the really good names. And so um, we're playing Manhasset at Manhasset. I think it's our, our sophomore year. And he gets us and he was a big time like, like rah rah guy. So he gets us in the wrestling room. And so we go to the wrestling room and you know we, we haven't fully dressed yet. And he has all these like eight by eleven uh pages with you know helter skelter on it and all this like pump up stuff. <laughs> and so we're you know there's 20 of us, 21, and he's he's trying to get us jacked up. He goes, You're going to Manhattan, these guys are the best, right? And he's just, he's just pumping them up and he's going, then he stops and he goes, look at you guys, you got nothing. <laughs> he, goes, <laughs> he goes, your jerseys don't match. So we look around at each other and we're like, yeah, you're right. We don't, because <laughs> we, we were on, we were always on austerity. And, and so you're getting hand-me-downs from different, you know, purchases. Right. So one guy says dragons, the other guy says division you know <laughs> the same numbers you know you'll you got no shorts you're short you guys look like you know rag pickers you know you got you don't have this you don't have this and he stops and he goes and they have it all <laughs> it was like the best class warfare speech. Was, they, they have it all you got nothing they got this they got that they got beautiful cars you should see their lawns he goes and they got ivy and it's quiet somebody raises their hand and they coach what's ivy and he goes you'll see when we get there that's great and we're like we're gonna kill him gonna strangle that, that, that ivy was, that was part of the love of the game in levittown is to hate the right. the other socioeconomic folks right Horse, yeah, to throw in, but they don't have heart like we have. Oh, that's good stuff. I like that story. So, Jerry, you're down at this camp raising hell at Blair, and now you're back at Chaminade. And so, how does your career, after getting cut from every team imaginable, how do you go from there to uh, you know, how does your high school career progress? And then, and then, where does where, how does the UMass thing happen? How do you get interested in go, going to play with Coach Garber? Well. You know, the, I, so I come back and I, you know, it's August and I remember playing summer league, summer league was at like Burner high school or Massapequa high school on Long Island. And I just started playing with the, the Levittown division guys. They needed some bodies for their summer league team. So it kind of, it perpetuated. And so by the time, and I played at that camp, I played midfield. And then I decided, and and I changed to attack. This is my my junior year. And by the time the season came around, I've told this story before because it's it's an all timer. The you know, I'm at Chaminade. The head coach of Chaminade is still the current head coach of Chaminade, Jack Moran, Richie Moran's nephew. Right. And Jack happens to become from the LVT. He's from Levittown. <laughs> who coached it? my brother. You know, freshman or you know, G -G yeah, yeah. My, say, my my junior year, he junior. benched me. Yeah. <laughs> so, so by this point, so it's my junior year. Stevens either a freshman or a sophomore in Virginia, and I go to try out. And again, I played one 
season of a sport at Chaminade, freshman basketball. I have not played a sport since. I've not made a team since. And the first thing they do at Chaminade is they have a mile run. And so I show up for a mile run, and my parents had just come back from a trip to Ireland. And and they went to the Iran Islands. So, if I, and Jay, you're Irish, is mm -hmm. the Iran Islands are famous for their fisherman sweaters, the cable knit sweater. It's like a little scratchy, but right. the thing could take a bullet, right? Right. I show yeah, up yeah. to the mile run with that sweater on, <laughs> and Jack Moran almost oh cut God. me on sight. <laughs> right. Like, and you I'm 100 percent convinced that the only reason he kept me on that team, and I didn't play at all my my junior year. I was as an attackman that the only reason he kept me is because my brother had become one of the great players in college lacrosse. And he knew we weren't adopted. I wasn't adopted. because we looked a little <laughs> bit And so, so I made the team, but didn't play. And then the next year I decided to play defense because my brother was, you know, he was a, a protector. He was my, you know, he was an inspiration. He was, you know, a guy who did the work. You know, he when he decided he wanted to be good, he'd be doing, you know, a lot of curls in the in the garage in Levittown with, you know, those those crappy weights we had, and right. and, and you know, you like you you'd have like Tide boxes, you know, you'd be like right. pressing whatever the you know like whatever was heavy in that right. in that garage. So like seeing my brother do that, I think about that to this day. Like, all right, well, I want to be good. I got to do some work if I want to be like him. I have to do that work. And ultimately, you know, my, my, my senior year, I had, you know, I, you know, I was six to 139 pounds when I graduated high school. Oh my God. That's yeah. a little lean. I was like, good height though. You think, you think my, my mom had me on like some sort of like diet. You know, I was locked <laughs> in my room, not eating. You know, it turns out if you eat a lot of Captain Crunch and, and Thomas's <laughs> English muffins, it doesn't put a lot of weight on. And so, so I ended up applying to a bunch of schools, including Virginia. I got, uh, I was a, I was a good student. I didn't have I had pretty good test scores, but not elite. And I didn't get into uh, Virginia because I wanted to, to, you know, I wasn't getting recruited. I didn't get recruited by anybody. So I ended up going to UMass because Jack Moran played at UMass and, yeah. and, you know, and I, listen, I ended up having an unbelievable academic experience at, at, UMass, you know, I, I really believe that you can get a great education anywhere if you if you care enough. So I I had a great academic experience, I had a great athletic experience there. I didn't I didn't even bring my equipment. I went my my the captain of, of my team at Chaminade was recruited to UMass and I went to the first practice and sat on the not on the sideline, but far enough away that I didn't look I wasn't obvious. And I watched them practice and I'm like, I can hang with those guys. So I, I called my dad wow. and my dad was a New York city fireman and my dad drove up, drove my high school equipment up so I could show up for the next wow. day. And I'm not sure my dad turned off the car. I think he gave me the <laughs> roll of quarters for, for laundry and smoked a butt and then left, right. oh, you know? God. And so, but like, you know, like your parents, your parents did that, you know, back then. Right. And so then I yeah. went to practice and I ended up being one of the freshmen who made the team and, you know, it, you know, lessons around, you know, putting yourself out there, which are, you know, I think very, you know, they're getting lost a little bit these days. Everybody wants a, an easy runway toward, toward things. And, you know, I needed to see with my own eyes that I could hang with people. And then, and then like from that point, like spent a lot of time, like not in a bad way, like in my brother's, shadow relative to the game and i i've said this many times like one of my for a long time i ended up playing in the mll when i was almost 40 years old was this pursuit of my brother and his stature and status in the game and again it wasn't a very joyous pursuit because like when you do that's such a wrong reason to pursue something mm -hmm. you know to even though my brother was an unbelievable inspiration to me it never made me feel bad about like following in his footsteps and things like that. But like, I, I took a lot of time and, but not a lot of great time to try to create my own kind of legacy and persona in the game. Mm -hmm. Jerry, I well, really appreciate you sharing you made all up that. For and, time. Yeah. Well, I, and Jerry, like having 
you know, seeing you play and having played against you in some club tournaments, you know, with Sailing Shoe and Brown State, like, I can't believe that you're describing the player that you're describing to me, you know, like, who didn't play at all until his senior year, wasn't recruited, and you go from that to three world team tryouts, you know? So, I I mean, it's a it's a great story, as you said, of, of work and perseverance and, and uh, you know, willing yourself into being an amazing player. I never would have guessed that, sort of having watched you later in your career when you were – I just know you as a great defenseman. So Yeah, that's something. That's amazing. So, Steve, you played for – you know, it's interesting. You guys both played for iconic coaches, right? I mean, two of the legends – in the coaching world. And, and Steve, you played for, for Ace Adams and some incredibly talented teams and, and you among the most talented of the bunch. So what was it like to play for Ace Adams and, and college across back in the, in the early eighties, you know, you, you guys are just year in and year out amongst the best in the country. Yeah. No, you know, it was funny because, and, you know, Jerry being, um, you know, such a great coach and just a phenomenal recruiter. You take what happens today and flip it on his head because in the 70s and I think even into the 80s, a lot of these coaches didn't come see players. I mean, Ace Adams, he coached at Penn, so he loved Mike Page, who was a Levittown guy, who was the midfield of the year at Penn, was an 82 national team player. He, I think he was a 77. His other brother played at Cornell. So Coach Adams was looking at Bob Page, and Bob was a year above me. He was a close friend. And so he was a he was a 78 grad. I was a 79 grad. And so you know, I, I got recruited. Jack Emmer really wanted me to come play at Washington and Lee. So that mm. was one of the trips I took my senior year which is a strange, was a strange trip. I ended up losing to Syracuse, but it was, a, it was, a, I, I really can't tell you the story. I'm on the right Still now. Still classified. Family podcast. <laughs> Different podcast. Um, the channel. But the guy, the guy who was Ace's eyes and ears on Long Island was Tom Flatley. Oh yeah. And, and Tom Flatley was a Sawanica coach. And we scrimmaged, I remember we scrimmaged Sawanica at division on, not even on our, on our, Main field is on that. On that not on the on main that. gravel field. This was not, the not, a, not on the, not the football yeah. field. Let me <laughs> tell you something right now. The football field with all the glass, <laughs> and we had the uh, the Bottle iron caps. cages with the fencing instead of the netting. Oh my god! We played yeah. them on that field. <laughs> nice. I was covering Mike Caravana, and oh, yeah. did a uh. did a good job on him. So Flatley was watching me, and so I had no idea that he was talking to Coach Adams. Because Coach mm-hmm. Adams never saw me play, so yeah. he was he was talking. Coach Adams was talking to Bob Page, and then he gets my phone number. He says, "I'd like you to come down with with Bob Page on a recruiting trip, my senior year." And Bob was at at uh, at awesome. Nassau, and he was uh, I think he was the attackman of the year. He was a fantastic player. Uh, and playing uh, at the community Dougie, college, yeah, yeah. Him and him and Dougie Hall were running mates. They were like the two attackmen and they were like just hellacious riders. So mm-hmm. I went down to UVA and kind of not realized, you know, that they're really interested in me. So I spent a weekend there with two guys from, uh, from Long Island, one guy from Sawanica, one guy from, uh, from Farmingdale and coach brings me in. He's, and he, he says, I heard all these good things, bop, bop, bop. And he goes, we'd like to offer you a half a scholarship. And I'm like, I was I was literally blown away. I, I'm I'm thinking. I mean, in my mind, I think if I well, if I can get in, I got to figure out how I'm going to pay for this because you know my my parents didn't have the money for that. Now, and, now, did you have a jean jacket and jeans on at the same time, <laughs> and a white comb in your back pocket? Well, that, that that's uh, I, there. I have a picture. I'll have to send it to you guys of of me. <laughs> and and Coach Byrne. So it's in front of my dorm at UVA and it's the day of the move-in day and we had gone to Bush Gardens down in Virginia Beach. Oh yeah. I I am wearing a Anheuser Busch beer cap on. I've got an Anheuser Busch beer t-shirt. 
<laughs> I've got my cutoff football pants. Remember when that was a thing? You cut the football <laughs> pants off. Steve, I'm not sure that was ever a thing. I, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> in Levittown, it was the you thing. You can pretend it in was Levitan a thing. Levittown, it was. Okay. Right. <laughs> so, so, and then Jerry's, sitting, Jerry's standing next to me, and he's like 5'7". <laughs> he's oh, like, man. he's at my shoulder. Right. And, and then he just shot up. And so, you know, for, for me, the recruiting was – Jack Emmer, and I liked W and L. It was small, but you were surrounded by girls' schools. They had a good team. There was a Levittown guy on the team, Jerry Broccoli from Memorial. But when I got on <laughs> TV, first, like, first of all, that's like a name from like Goodfellas, Jerry Broccoli. Jerry Broccoli. <laughs> two times is Jerry Broccoli, who who likes you know green beans, you know. Right. Yeah. Joey, Stacey, Joey Stacey was, an, was another guy from Memorial who played. <laughs> Tommy Federico. So at one time nice. in 1980, between North Carolina and UVA, there were no, I was something to say for Virginia, NC State, and Carolina, there were 11 Levittown guys playing between those three schools. Wow. That's amazing. And those schools yeah. were never the same after. They were I, I also, <laughs> you're right, about, you're right about that time. When they started putting locks on lockers. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, I also like, you know, you. I really appreciate how you talked about the great education you got at UMass Amherst and your brother's talking about Washington Lee. It was surrounded by a lot of girls' schools, so that got me very interested. You know, not it didn't seem like he was exploring the curriculum down there very much, Jerry. No, it was, you know, I, I was always jealous of Jerry because, number one, he was smarter and he was more diligent than I was. But he also went to a really good school. And I cannot, I mean, I, I was, you know, I was top of the class at division. I get down to UVA and, you know, they wanted to toss me because I could barely write, you know. And so it was, it was, I honest to the, God. Didn't have the my, same preparation. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it was, it was a two year mm -hmm. battle just to stay in school, you know. Mm. Well, one of the things Steve went like, I, I tell you know, Steve's lines better than him sometimes. One of the things that he would say about him, Mike Caravana, for your listeners, was a, you know, probably the best attackman on Long Island in, in 1979 mm -hmm. when he's graduated. Steve was the best defenseman on Long Island that year, and they both end up at UVA. And Steve would tell the story is like, by day two, we felt three years behind. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, you know, Ron, you're too young. Like back when you had to like learn how to, like like the concept of a term paper and citations and like the whole concept of footnoting might as well have been Sanskrit. Like how did, like if you could, like a Chaminade, if you didn't cite and like if the comma and the semicolon, like all the stuff that went into that, if you didn't do that right, it was like a letter grade. So my brother <laughs> goes down to, to, so like for me, ironically, I wasn't good enough to play at Virginia and probably would have been fine academically. My brother right. was a perfect fit, but my brother was smart. He is a great writer. The fact that, you know, you felt behind as a writer, it's one of his, his great skills and gifts. <laughs> my only skill. Yeah. That was, that was the, this thing I, I go, I'm getting my ass kicked everywhere. I go out creative writing. I know I can do this first paper D minus red all over the page. And it was a, it was a TA this young woman. And I said, this can't be right. She goes, I, I can see something in there, but, <laughs> but, but what to find out exactly what that young woman TA at the university of Virginia in the seventies found in that paper. You'll have to come back next week as we continue with our series with the brothers burn. Can't wait to see you then until we meet again. Here's to hoping you find the twine. We're signing off here at the Get the Lax Scoop. Thanks again so much. We will see you the next time.